Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I wish everyone a very happy Sunday morning on this beautiful fall day. Um, I'm really excited this morning to share with you. It's, it's a very simple talk. This is not going to be this, you know, several point talk. And, and I just want to share my heart and what I've been discovering from the beautiful life of Pope Carolus. Like I said, I am just sharing from what I've read from this book called A Silent Patriarch. This is the life um, and legacy of His Holiness Pope Carolus. Really, really, really an amazing book. And, and I encourage all of you all to, to pick it up. Um, if you read a few pages of it, I'm telling you, it will bring you to want to pray. It'll want you to, to, to enter into the presence of God and feel the power of God. And that's all you can see through the life of Pope Carolus. What I want to share with you today, obviously it's not the whole life. I mean, Pope Carolus, like I said, this, this book is, is it's a very long book and there's so many things that we can reflect on, his, his holiness and his miracles. But there's one virtue that has been really touching me and has opened up my eyes. And I, and I want to share it with all of you because I feel like if we understood the secret of this virtue that he has, maybe we would experience real glory in our life, a real closeness to Jesus a real deep experience with the Lord. And it's this com concept of kenosis. When I think of, and I'll explain what that is, when I think of, um, when I think of Pope Carolus, I think of miracles. I think we've all heard, maybe we've all read um, different books of the miracles of Pope Carolus, and they're so inspiring and so exciting to read because how can one man have, have, have performed so many thousands and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of miracles just by, again, how often you hear people experiencing his, the power of his intercessions and his prayers and this, this spiritual gift that he was given. But there's something that most people don't know about. Again, I think um, maybe the, the older generation currently loves to intercede to Pope Carolus and, and they, they ha carry his picture in their wallets and have it all over their house. Pope Carolus is somebody that I really believe that if people understood the depth of his life, you'd understand the secret to his power. And it's this concept of when you, Pope Carolus, when he was Pope, was ridiculed severely by bishops, priests, church leaders, the lay council, which is like the kind of like a, like the lay person council. It's kind of like an accountability board for the patriarch and, and a bit of a, a support system for the patriarch administratively. Pope Carolus you don't realize, was looked down upon in such a way by every single person. And he was like despised and he was treated poorly and disrespected. They did say, they, some, somebody used to say, there's a saying in Arabic, El Galis al Arsh Marimoros, which means the enthroned, the enthroned on the, the, the seat of St. Mark. They used to call him El Gahil. Not the enthroned, but it's a play on words, which means the ignorance on the chair or the, the ignorance on the seat of St. Mark. Can you imagine that they used to look to Pope Carlos and say he was ignorant and he was somebody that, like, I want you to imagine in the, the church at that point had been in darkness for decades and under three patriarchs before him, um, one of them was, was kidnapped. The other one was like, you know, went back to his monastery the church was in the darkest of times during those three decades. And Pope Carlos comes on scene and people are waiting, okay, who is this person that's going to reform the church from the darkness that it's in, um, all this uh, evil and corruption and bribing and people paying in for their positions as bishops. It was a very, very, very ugly time. And here comes Abu Namina the Solitary, or the recluse, who, which is Pope Carlos before he was ordained as patriarch. People thought, okay, that's it. It's game time. We're going to have real change take place in the church. And the thing that you can not deny in his life is that he was attached to the altar of God. And he maintained his spiritual canon every day. He would pray liturgies when he was a recluse, when he was just living in the windmill or as a hermit. Every morning he would make orban, pray the midnight praises for a couple of hours, and then pray liturgy every day. He'd fast until 3 p.m., he ate very little. It was rarely seen that he ever ate chicken or meat. He was just living a very holy ascetic life. He was offered to be a bishop several times, and every time he just wanted to be alone with Jesus. Until 
he moved to Cairo. He moved in the windmill, which was local to Cairo. So people started to get to know him. Little by little, they, they heard of the, the, the virtues of this man, and his miracles. And then he moved to a, a church called St. Mina's in Old Cairo. And I want you to understand something about uh, this, this special season in his life. So there's something called the Sunday School Movement that was started by Habib Gerges. And the disciples of this movement are people called, a man called Nazir Gayed. Maybe you've heard of him. It's the late Pope Shenouda III before he was, uh, became a monk. His name was Nazir Gayed. Um, the late Bishop Gregorius, who was a scholar uh, in theology and biblical studies. You have Amba Athanasius ben from Benesuif, another uh, amazing father and man. You have Amba Domedius of Giza, Amba Samuel, the Bishop of uh, Social Ecumenical Services. Pope Carolus discipled men that in our generation were the giants that carried the revival of the Coptic Church. And when you look and you say, who was these people's spiritual father? You say, wow, what an amazing leader that Pope Carolus, you know, was able to spot out these young men and disciple them. He didn't spot out anybody. Pope Carolus lived a holy life. And I've been talking about this the last three weeks. This concept of just abiding in Christ, going into his cave, living his life along with God, connecting with Jesus, experiencing his love, being addicted to that love, being addicted to the beauty that is in Jesus. And little by little, these young men who were longing for more started to come to learn from him. Even Abu Namat al was, was one. So all of the leaders that you might be uh, uh, consider yourself children of in this generation, they were all children of, of Pope Carolus. And you say, how did he spot them out? He didn't. Pope Carolus literally just lived a holy life and the light that, of Christ that was in him was attracting these men to, to, to come and to learn from him. And as they started this Sunday school movement and they wanted to reform the church, start, you know, uh, growing the education in the church, there was a lot of uh, lack of education among the clergy and the bishops. People didn't know anything about the Bible or the church or theology. It was just a disaster at that time. And these young men, discipled by the spiritual life of Abu Namina the Solitary, who was known as Pope Carolus. We became disciples of Carolus, and they revolutionized the church. And we experienced in the last 45 years, 50 years, just a power running through the church, where the church spread out throughout the whole world, and amazing leaders, and 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 and. And all this fruit that came out of it, the revival of hymns and the right revival of uh, theological education, the revival of just the churches, the revival of the liturgy, the revival of so many things that we all are so blessed to be counted as in this generation. From a person that came at a time where nobody recognized him, they called him somebody who was ignorant, not highly age educated, not somebody that was going to wow you. I want you to imagine the church being in utter chaos and and darkness. And all of a sudden we have a new Pope and the, the Pope comes on scene and you don't hear any sermons out of him. All you know, he played a liturgy every day. He played Asheya every day. He, he didn't give any sermons. He, you know, every once in a while he wrote maybe uh, a, a letter for Easter or a letter for Christmas. And that's our Pope. And you're sitting waiting for reform. You're waiting for the church to change. And you're thinking, what is he doing? Where is our Pope? Apparently, he's not educated enough or skilled enough. He's just sitting there praying all day when we need change. And Pope Carola sat there. And he didn't say a word. He didn't defend himself. He didn't show off his miracles. He could have easily, he was actually, he did miracles for some of the people that were ridiculing him, but not to show off, but out of love for the people that attacked him. Unbelievable. And Pope Carolus chose the way of nothingness. He chose the way of being nothing in the eyes of the people. Literally nothing. You're like waiting, okay, we have all these issues in the education. We have corrupt clergy. We have bishops that uh, bought their way into uh, their, their bishopric or their ordination. And you're like, do something. And all he was doing was praying at the altar. You see, so many of us, if Pope Carlos was around today, as 
people are doing today to our blessed patriarch and our beloved patriarch, Pope Tawadros, they sit back and they think they know what's best for the church and they mock and they ridicule and they post on, on social media without one ounce of understanding of what is in the heart of God. I'm telling you, the grace that you and I live and have lived in for the last 40 years under the beautiful papacy of His Holiness Pope Shenouda, I believe came as a fruit of the personal death and kenosis of Pope Robos the sixth during his papacy. Kenosis means self-emptying. He made himself of no reputation. He made himself nothing. I'm gonna tell you guys some, some things that that people would, would say about Pope Carlos constantly being mocked, con con constantly being taught told that he is like ignorant and he's not doing anything. One example, when he was when he was Abu Namina and people were nominating him to become the patriarch, right? He was one of the nominees to become the Pope of Alexandria after these three very dark times under the last three popes before him. And during the elections, after this this, this death of uh, Pope Yusab II, there was a monk called Abu Arabius al Maharai who was campaign campaigning for one of the monks in his monastery to be Pope. And so they heard that uh, Pope Krolos or Abu Namina the Solitary was um, famous and he was one of the, 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 the choices and everybody was excited about him. Started to defame him and say even that his, mag that his miracles were done of magic and it's just like sorcery. It's not really done from God and very, very, very shameful things. Even put to shame Pope Krolos and they said bad things even in front of his family. And they would put him down. And so after Pope Carlos became a patriarch, people used to say, what do you think about uh, Abu Nagabius al-Maharai al 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 who's saying all these bad things? He says, it's out of his zeal. Could you imagine? You're the Pope. And now it's time to take action, to discipline these people who have caused havoc in the church and have made all these problems. He said, guys, he did it out of zeal. He did it out of love. Not trying to, to cover himself. And then, Pope Carlos called for Abu Arabius and put him in the church that he served in, that he loved and that he built, called St. Mina's in Old Cairo. And he put him there and Abu Arabius thought, all right, this is the worst. He's bringing me close so he could spy on me and he's going to, to observe me and punish me and, and get revenge on me. Instead, three years later, Pope Carlos ordained Arabius as the metropolitan of one of the, the dioceses in Sudan, later became metropolitan Stephanos, who would tell this story, the Metropolitan, Stephanos, would tell this story frequently, in tears, very humbled, that Pope Carolos never, never, never got revenge. He always accepted the ridicule. He would never defend himself. He would he rarely, rarely try to, to, to get revenge. Something very, very... Like, like how do you do it? What he was doing is that he was mimicking the life of Jesus. You and I, if we had a Pope that just sat there, prayed liturgies, and do Tazbaha every day, and pray Ashayas, and we don't hear any speeches from him, he's not uh, speaking to the, the government to get the rights of the cops, what would you say? Who is this? What is he doing? He's sitting there doing nothing, uh, relaxing in the cathedral while all of us are going through, through miserable times. And he chose to stay humble and, and, and ashamed. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 12. And I'm going to get to what, I'm, what, I, what I want all of us to learn. If it wasn't for Pope Carolus and his life, we would not have had disciples like, again, Pope Shenouda and all the wonderful patriarchs that are our bishops that were in the time or in the, during the papacy of Pope Shenouda. If it wasn't for the personal death of Pope Carlos. Listen to me. Jesus says this in John chapter 12, verse 23. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life 
in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. What is the Lord Jesus saying here? He says very, very clearly, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, what happens? It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus did that. And the same thing happened in the life of Jesus. I want you to imagine the corruption of, of the Roman uh, uh, soldiers and what they've done to the people of Israel and how the people are kind of under just oppression and, and waiting for their deliverer. And here comes Jesus on the scene. He's a carpenter, okay? He hangs around with fishermen, loves to share the word of God with very simple people. He, he spends time with tax collectors and sinner women. And who is this guy? Like, who is this person? And literally, Jesus was brought to the death with nobody next to him, a few people. And I want you to imagine that Jesus died and they say, what a failure. What a failure. It seemed like he was going to be great. You know, he had something going for him, but uh, just another one. Just another prophet that died. Never. When Jesus died and went into the ground, it produced much fruit for all of us. It produced resurrection for all of humanity. Now, Pope Carolos chose that same lifestyle. He chose that same lifestyle to accept shame, to surround him by people that mocked him, people that insulted him. He would know, for example, there was a person that wrote about him in the newspaper, about how uh, ignorant he is and how he can't lead this church. He's not fit to be the patriarch. And Pope Carolus went and visited him and found out that his daughter was sick. He went and prayed for his daughter and healed him. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. He says, oh, you're talking about the article that you wrote? Don't worry about it. I don't think anything of it. What? They put in your name in the newspapers and shaming you. And you don't care? He accepted to die. He accepted this death that if he dies, there will be much fruit. You know, it's so easy to say, oh, nothing really happened during the days of Pope Carolos, but when Pope Shenouda came, Pope Shenouda, God rest his soul, was part of this resurrection, part of what God did to revive the church that God used Pope Shenouda to spread it, but it took the death of Pope Carolus. It took that, that, that self-sacrifice, that self-emptying to go into the ground to produce much fruit. Imagine the churches were empty in the days of Pope Carolus. And then every day there's an altar, there's a liturgy at the altar, there's tisbahat, there's people getting attached once again to a life of worship. It was no longer this like cultural association where, oh, yeah, the cops, they go to church and the Muslims go to the mosque. And No, he was really raising up and, and, and men who were seeking to, to do miracles and, and to, 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 to be connected to God clung to Pope Carolus. And by Pope Carolus's personal death, he revolutionized single-handedly the Coptic church. I'm telling you, as you read the stories of Pope Carolus over and over again, he was brought shame. It says that Pope Carolus hated to be around people that praised him. He would distance them and he would bring the people around him that would um, were, were truth tellers. It says in this book, it says Abun Rafael of Amina, after thinking what Pope Carolus' greatest strength was, he says he surrounded himself with those who did not flatter, but rather opposed him. What? Why would you stick yourself around people that are negative or that are opposing you? Like, why would you do that? Like, why would you want these people, okay, to, 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 to be, like, be around you? That negative energy. He never wanted for a second to think highly of himself. He accepted to die for Christ, that Christ would show, that Christ would be glorified. Of course, who is excited about this message? Who is excited about becoming that grain of wheat that is buried into the ground shamefully? Nobody respects him. Nobody uh, sees his glory and dies a, a, 
a silent patriarch. The, the patriarch without any sermons, the patriarch that does, doesn't like, nobody really knew much about him. Few people experienced his miracles or were able to, to spread those miracles, but for the most part, they said, oh, he's just doing sorcery. How, how, how difficult is that? Imagine, it says that Pope Carolus kept his brother around him all the time. And when, when Abun Rafi'il of Amina, the disciple of Pope Carolus, was serving the patriarch, it says there was not a single time that Hannah, Pope Carolus' brother, told him, you are good, you are a saint. Instead, each time he would ask him, why did you do this or why did you do that? And precisely because of this, Carolus respected him greatly. If Hannah had flattered him, he would have had nothing to do with him. How many of us are willing to bring fruit to the church and to our children and to our families and to our ministries by accepting a personal death? And I'm not talking about a physical death, meaning not seeking your own glory, not seeking your own way. This is the way of Jesus. Turn with me, your Bibles, to Philippians chapter 2. Listen to what St. Paul tells us. St. Paul instructs us. Philippians 2, from verses 1 to 10. I'm speaking about right here, I'm going to be reading about the Son of God. Okay, I want you to imagine everything you would hope the Son of God to be. Everything that you would expect the Son of God to be living on this earth. Listen to what St. Paul says. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. So he says, if you have any fellowship of the Holy Spirit, if you are connected to the Holy Spirit, have the same mind, be like-minded. Then he says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then St. Paul says this amazing verse that should bring you and I to need to obey this. St. Paul says in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which it was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So he's saying he didn't consider like he wasn't stealing God's glory to be equal with God. He was equal with God. But listen to this. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. You want to have the mind of Jesus? The mind of Jesus is to make yourself nothing for Christ. The mind of Jesus is to make yourself nothing for the salvation of the whole world, for the salvation of your family, to fast and pray for them, to deny yourself. You're like, I don't like fasting. Accept a death for yourself, for the people around you that you can produce much grain. Accept a death in loving the people that need to be loved, the lost, the people who are so far, and they might shame you if you reach out to them. And they might think that you're a goody two-shoes or you think you are this, this perfect saint and you think you're better than everybody else. Accept that shame. Accept it for the sake of Christ. And do what? Continue to love in the face of ridicule. Con continue to give when you're being shamed. This is the mind of Jesus. Can any of us possibly be called children of God? Can any of us be in the kingdom of God? Can any of us go to heaven without the mind of Jesus? Would we fit in in heaven with the angels and with Christ himself? Unless we've accepted to make ourselves like this, unless you have the mind of Jesus, I don't know what to say. Unless you have the mind of Jesus, which is everything I just read, okay? He was equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a servant. He was found in appearance as a man. Imagine God being a man. Humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. 
Why, Lord Jesus, would you do this? Because there's a mystery in that life. There is a certain powerful mystery that will work in the person that accepts that death. I'm not, I know, like, th this is not the, the, the hottest topic that everybody wants to be sharing. It's not exciting. Because I'm calling you to death. But I am telling you, I'm showing you the proof that the glory days that we experienced in the Coptic Church were from, the, in, the, in the era of Pope Shenouda, are actually a fruit of the personal death of Pope Carolus. How he allowed himself to be mocked. He's a miracle performer and did hundreds of thousands of miracles. In, in the 1960s, somebody in, in, in our generation, in our lifetime, was doing hundreds of thousands of miracles by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and had visions of the heavenly and was a very, very amazing holy man and yet accepted to be mocked and surrounded him by people that were not people that were going to praise him. Why am I saying this? Because as I've been reflecting about all the excuses that I make for everything, like if I make an excuse about waking up early, I say, okay, well, if I accept that death, maybe a fruit will come out of it. Maybe if I um, accept whatever cross that the Lord has given me, some fruit is going to come out of it. Something so sweet and powerful and glorious. Pope Carlos didn't get to see it until the day he died. He didn't get to see those glory days. He accepted that this was going to be his papacy. He was happy living in a cave by himself, living his prayer life. He had people that came. He would have, you know, disciples. He could share the word of God and live in his own little cave praying for the world. And God brought him out to be a patriarch of the Coptic church. How difficult that must have been for him to think like, I was loving my little cave and my own little life and standing at the altar. And people were mocking him, saying, when are you going to stand up for the cops? There was a time where somebody came and said, enough, your holiness, enough praying. We need you to go speak to the government. The Coptic people don't have jobs. They're suffering. He says, I'm sorry, my son. Uh, uh, let's pray about it. He says, enough saying, let's pray. We need action. He says, okay, let's, let's see what God will do. He spent three days fasting and prayer, saying, God, you have to do something. And for a long time, people had been telling him, he, the Pope Carlos is sitting there watching, tens of thousands of uh, our, our Coptic youth not working. He went into his room, he offered a fast and prayer. He came out in the newspapers a few days later that the, and, and, uh, a presidential order to hire, I don't know how many thousands of Coptic youth for work. And that person that came was ridiculing the Pope said, I'm so sorry. I, I'm really sorry. And he says, prayer changes everything. Trust me, my son. Prayer changes everything. He didn't say, how could you speak to the Pope that way? What do you mean you don't want us to pray? We're, we're God's people. No, he just said, forgive me, my son. Another person, he rebuked sharply for, for something uh, wrong that they were doing. And, and, and Pope Close rebuked them. And then eventually he heard that that bishop was, was very upset at him. And he went, oh, sorry, it wasn't a bishop, it was actually a priest. And Pope Carlos went, and he offered, he bowed down before him. And he asked for his absolution, his forgiveness. Pope Carlos, the saintly man, accepted to, to, it says he was always asking for forgiveness. He would ask for forgiveness for anybody that he would upset. Because he wanted to live the life of Jesus. And he didn't care what people are going to say about the, the, the great Pope. How could you, like, lower yourself to, to asking for forgiveness? He would say to his disciple, one of the great uh, bishops that, that also was like martyred, Bishop Samuel, and he would tell him, I still haven't reached humility. Pray that one day I can have humility. But Carlos, you don't have humility. It says like on the day of his ordination as Pope, there were the heads of state and patriarchs of churches and they got him, the emperor of Ethiopia got him these fancy uh, garments to wear in the liturgy. And it says he chose to wear his monastic, humble garment during the, the ordination of his liturgy. Why? Because he, he never wanted to forget himself as a monk. We are called to this mind of Christ for the breaking of ourselves. In today's gospel, we see a sinner woman. She came and she takes an alabaster flask and she breaks it. 
And she anoints the feet of Jesus with oil. And these flasks, the only way you can get the pure smelling ointment that is inside of them is by breaking them. I believe that that breaking of that alabaster flask is the breaking of ourselves. That if we break ourselves for God and for others, a pure, sweet smelling aroma will come out of your life. Fruit will come out of your life. Glory will come out of your life, but not if you fight for your own image and your own rights and your own uh, perception in, in, in people's eyes. Pope Carolus the Great accepted to be ridiculed and mocked his whole life and even after his life. But now, when you say Pope Carolus, his picture is in the house of every Coptic person born from t today to you know back 100 years. Pope Carolus is the powerful intercessor of hundreds of thousands of Copts, all because the power that came out of his life was when he accepted a death. Are you going through a difficult time today? Are you going through some type of shame, some type of brokenness? Accept it with the mind of Jesus and say, Lord, I accept to be a servant, a slave, made of no reputation, to go through these difficult things, Lord, because you said unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The Lord wants you to produce fruit, to be maybe the mother that labors her whole life for her children. And the kids are little brats their whole life. But one day, maybe even after you die, they're going to say, we remember that our mother died for us. That she didn't seek anything for herself. And you always hear this of people speaking of their mothers who, who, who like selflessly give themselves their whole life being uh, spoken at by their kids rudely, maybe disrespected, maybe that the, these mothers don't reach the high education that their, their children reach. But later on one day they will realize the glory of a life well lived by somebody who gave themselves and made themselves of no reputation. Today, I'm encouraging you to take that same alabaster flask at the feet of Jesus and break it. That alabaster flask is you. And a sweet smelling aroma will come and anoint the head and the feet of Jesus. A sweet smelling aroma of your brokenness for God, of your giving up yourself for God, of your dying for Christ. Accepting people's ridicule. I'm not telling you something easy. I'm not telling you something that I'm very good at. But I'm being humble and I'm being asked by the Lord to go down this path. Down the path of walking the life of Jesus. Pope Carolus resembled Jesus in his life. Again, at the end, people said, ah, oh, he did miracles, but he died and there was nothing special about his days in, in the days of Pope Carolus. But it was his life that started a revolution through the amazing bright stars of his disciples, Pope Carlos, I'm sorry, Pope Shenouda and Amber Gregorius and um, Amba, Amba Athanasius of Benesweif and Amba Samuel and Amba Domadius of Giza and Abu Namat al Maskin, all of these children of Pope Carlos, I promise you, they were shining lights because they received that light from the torch of Pope Carlos's holy life. Today, I encourage you, close the door to your room. Accept being uncomfortable. Accept being tired. Accept all these things for the sake of Jesus. But I tell you, there will be a resurrection in the people that are around you if you accept this death. Have the mind of Christ. Have the mind of Christ and you will experience Christ. You will see Jesus. But as long as you don't have the mind of Christ, you never understand the things that Jesus does. You're always maybe complaining. How come Jesus allowed this? And where was the Lord when I prayed to him about this? And how could he have allowed these things to happen? Because we don't have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is accepting us emptying ourselves of all glory. But maybe my children will come out to be saints. Maybe my, my, my family will shine. You say, how? Because... This person died for Jesus.
allowed his whole life or her whole life to be considered as nothing, to be considered nothing special. But I'm telling you, what mattered to Bokovus were the eyes of Jesus, not the eyes of men, standing at his altar and praying to him and offering himself, offering himself as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice before the Lord. May God grant us as well to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, to accept and to love. I know this is hard, to love the shame. Even Jesus, was. it was said about him in Hebrews, despising the shame. He didn't care. He didn't care. He took up his cross with joy. He loved that he was going to die for you and for me. May we do that and may we have that same zeal and may the church be revived by our death. That's why St. Paul says, death is working in me, but life is in you. I know that as long as I die, the fruit of that death will be this major fruit that will, will come throughout the church and give life to the church. And may that happen for us, for our families, and for those that are around us. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I highly, highly, highly encourage everyone, get this book. It's, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing book. I can't speak about it enough. I, I pray for Abuna Daniel um, Fanus and his great work and, and, and what he did in, in putting this together to his PhD. May God bless him, reward him, and keep us by the intercessions of St. Mary Theotokos, Pocrolos, and St. Mina, the great saint. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We acknowledge, Lord, that we're always, we can never, like, accept shame. and We can never accept to be made of no reputation. It's just not the ways of the world. But when, Lord, are we going to have the mind of Christ to accept the death and the, and the ridicule and the insults and to accept it with joy, to say, Lord, as long as I stand at your altar, th then, then I, I fear nothing. Lord, we come before you asking that you would give us this zeal and this faith to know that if a grain goes into the ground and dies, it will bring forth much fruit. That we can really be like Jesus and have the mind of Jesus esteeming others higher than ourselves. Lord, we're humbled by this holy life that gave himself so that we could experience the revolution and the reformation of, of a glorious church. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for Give us, giving us these examples of the holy lives of, of Pope Krolus and Pope Shenouda and the, the, the great fathers who, we li who lived among us that we got to see their glory and your glory in them. We pray this in your holy and precious name. The presence of all your saints make us very dear thank for our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth which is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Leave us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all.